Karen, I'm just double checking that you meant to unshare that title slide. Okay. Getting ready to share mine. April, I'm going to leave you as co-host just so you can help Kelly out with and letting people in and stuff. Okay, sounds great. Okay, and it is nine o'clock. Are you are you ready, Karen? Yes. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to offer another welcome again. As I said, my name is Kelly Bacon. I am the president of the Nebraska Museums Association. And I'd like to welcome you to our first session of our virtual conference, a, a session on photograph preservation. And it's going to be a workshop for everyone. Karen's going to have some great kind of hands-on um, tools and things to show. Yep, she's getting, she already has her gloves on, as you can see. <laughs> so this session goes from 9 a.m. to about noon, but Karen Adam does have some um, kind of pauses, you know, built in there where we can ask questions. So we aren't going to, we're going to hold questions. Feel free if you, when you have questions to type them in the chat, but we're going to hold them until each kind of section of her presentation is over. So we won't wait until the entire um, three hour workshop is over. Um, let's see. Um, I'd like to remind people to keep their video off unless you are speaking. So if you're, um, so Karen really after I'm done should be the only one with her camera on. Hopefully that'll help save bandwidth um, for everybody. And then um, I th I'd like to introduce Karen Keir, who is our leader of our workshop. She is the photograph curator at History Nebraska. She's been here, been there for quite a few years now. I'm not exactly sure, but we've worked together that entire time. She is also a board member on NMA. She does our website and is the communications editor. And if you like, um, if you have any questions, like I said, feel free to type them in chat. I will be monitoring the session as your proctor and I will ask questions for you. But if you do have a specific question or want to, you know, show Karen something um, during those kind of pauses and the question times, you know, feel free and we can, you know, let you do that also. So again, thank you for attending our conference. We hope you enjoy this session and um, I'd like to encourage you when this is over, there will be a 15 minute break, but feel free to either you know, stay logged in or log off and log back in because we'll, we'll be having sessions for the rest of the day. So Karen, if you would like to start talking, <laughs> start your workshop. Sounds great. Uh, I wanna welcome everybody. Thanks for um, participating um, in the NMA virtual conference. Um, it's been fun putting it together with Audrey's great leadership. Um, so, like Kelly said, I've been the photograph curator here at um, History Nebraska for it'll be 12 years in May. Um, and before that, I was the curator, research curator out at Stir Museum for about 10 years. So in total, I've been working with the photograph collections for almost 22 years. So um, it's my passion. I love what I do. I think I've got the coolest job in the entire state. I know probably most of you will argue with that because we are all very passionate about our jobs and love what we do. But I have to say, looking at in a million photographs of historic of, uh, Nebraska history is pretty darn cool. So we're gonna cover a lot today. Oop, there we go. 
Um, we're gonna talk, we're gonna go do a brief history of um, photography. I think that's a great background to um, understand how, what photography is and, and why it is what it is. We're also gonna talk about identifications of pr uh, photograph prints and, uh, and then also talk about identifying negatives. We're gonna talk about creating our best conditions about storage. We're gonna talk about identifying issues and what to do to fix those issues. I'm gonna um, touch briefly on research and identification as well as um, creating access through digitization. Um, the digitization part is probably gonna be a lot shorter than you probably would like, but um, that is a whole nother session. So another workshop for another time, but we'll go over a little bit today. All right, so we're gonna just go ahead and jump right in. Photography was invented um, in the early 1826 in France, it was the, um, Napriz was the first one to create a stabilized image. Before that, they were using the camera scura to kind of project something onto the wall and then sketch it out with either a pencil or watercolors or something like that to create an image. So they were able to take this camera scura and, and figure out how to create sensitive, um, light sensitive paper and light sensitive salts to actually produce a photo photograph. Um, the exposure for this photograph, which is the first um, known photograph from 1826, um, it's a, is, took eight hours in direct light. So it is, of course, a landscape, not that you can see it very well, um, but it was really hard for them to overcome this long exposure. Um, but they kept on trying. Um, Daguerre had a breakthrough in about 1939. He actually started working with Dupriis. Um, and then when Dupriis passed away, um, Daguerre um, announced that he had success in, in 1839. The French gr government actually uh, acquired the patent for Daguerre's um, uh, for, uh, process and then presented that as a gift to the world, making it free and available to everybody rather than having it copyrighted and only a few people could use it. This is about the time that photography became um, commercially available with the first daguerreotype. Um, and it began the era of photography. It was a very experimental process it was a race to see who could make photography the most effective and the most profitable. Um, they not only were the early photographers artists, they were also scientists. Um, and many, so there was many, many types of early photographs, some of them more successful than others. Um, a great example was Talbot. He was uh, an early scholar and he actually was the first one to make a negative. And the benefit of the negative is, is that then you're able to make endless positive duplicates. All right, so that was my brief history of photography. So we're gonna talk about the early forms, which are these direct positives, the daguerreotypes, amber types, and tintypes. Um, there are positive images made in the camera, so there's no negative, and these are usually one of a kind. There is, you can't make duplicates of them like you can with negatives. Negatives vary by their substrate, either they're going to be paper, glass, or plastic, and there's lots of different types of plastic, acetate, nitrate, um, diacetate, triacetate, and then um, the modern polyester. Negatives are made in the camera, and then they're used to create the positive image, or the print. Um, prints are usually on paper, but honestly, photography photographs can be put on anything. I've seen photographs on cloth. I've seen photographs on leather, um, ceramic. Um, if you can get the emulsion to stick, you can make a photograph. Um, so usually you have uncoated paper, which is a one layer process, coated paper, which is a two or three layer process, and then color prints. So we're going to talk um, right off the bat about direct positives. All right, so daguerreotypes are one of my favorite kind of photographs. Hopefully you'll be able to see as I hold up my show and tell here. I'm gonna try really hard here. 
Okay. So these are very popular from about the 18th, 1839 when they first were introduced to the world in France till about the 1860s. They're often referred to mirrors with memories because of their highly reflective surface. I don't know if you can, well, I think hopefully you can see me and I'm holding up the daguerreotype that we have here. And as I move it from up and down, you can see that it goes from positive to negative depending on the angles of the view. Derek aerotype is made um, by taking a copper plate um, and layering that with a fine, finely polished silver. A few crystals of iodine is used to make the silver light sensitive or the silver light sensitive, sorry. And then, explode, then they expose the plate in the camera. Um, it takes a few minutes, to, depending on the lighting conditions, it takes either a few minutes to up to 30 minutes. So I, I don't know if you can imagine trying to take a picture of a child or uh, an animal that you have to try to get to sit still for either three to four minutes or 30 minutes. It's almost impossible. Um, the if image is invi um, visible when it's out of the camera. You go, you, it's revealed by a developing the plate into vapors of heated mercury. Um, the immense, it's immersed in a heated, uh, heated table salt to stabilize the uh, residue photosensitive components. This is the structure of a daguerreotype. So if I was to take this out, you would be able to see the copper plate and then the polished silver on top of it. And then the little, uh, well, you wouldn't be under the microscope, you'd be able to see the um, silver mercury um, structure. Daguerreotypes are, the surface of the daguerreotype is very, very soft. So soft that if you breathed heavily on it without its, gla with its glass removed, that you could actually damage it. It's always found in a package. It's always gonna be found in a case. Sometimes they're leather like this, but they can also be um, a, like a union case, which is kind of a harder um, early uh, resin. And then you have the daguerreotype itself. You're going to have a metal spacer. In this case, you can see the metal spacer is um, brass. And then a piece of glass over top of it. And then there's going to be, let me get my other show and tell here. There's going to be a brass or a brass frame that wraps around the outside of the daguerreotype. There's also they're also going to use an animal intestine or some sort of maybe tape or something to seal that all of those pieces together, the daguerreotype, the spacer, the glass, all get sealed together using either animal membranes or sometimes it's a paper with a um, like a glue-based substance on it to help seal in those edges. Deterioration of that is usually caused by um, the membrane breaking down um, and then in pollutants and humidity getting into, um, touching that silver inside of it. It'll look, end up looking something like this. This is a different one. And you can barely see the image on this one because what's happened is the membrane has broken down and um, the air exposure to air has caused it to um, start to tarnish. Never, never touch the surface of the daguerreotype. Never take it apart yourself. Um, talk, ask a help, um, reach out to a conservator for help. Like I said, I've worked with photographs for almost 22 years and have never taken a daguerreotype apart. If the seal is broken, the seal, it will tarnish. It'll cause that colored haze um, that you kind of seen there. Um, you can contact a conservator to see if they can help reseal it. Daguerreotypes should be stored in a cool, dry environment. We like to construct customized boxes for ours. Um, and they'll be um, up on the NMA website. I've got, I'm gonna have a handout that tells you how to make one of these little boxes. 
hold your daguerreotypes in. Um, so always try to avoid um, light source um, when, when displayed. And then the other thing you need to watch for is the original glass covers will deteriorate. Um, and I think many of you are familiar with weeping glass, which is when the gla early glass was a little softer and it'll start to like bubble down or drip down. And we don't want it, those little drips um, on the surface of the glass to touch the very soft surface of the daguerreotype. So uh, we've worked with the conservators at the Ford Center to re replace some of our glasses, our glass, um, glass pieces of our daguerreotypes um, when they started weeping. You can see them as kind of tiny, tiny whitish spots on the interior side of the glass. Amber types are the next um, type of photographs. Again, these are one of a kind. There's no negative. So um, there's no duplicates of it unless at some point in time somebody made a duplicate of it. Um, there were patents in the US by James Ambrose. And if you get to, if you create a photograph process, apparently you get to name it after yourself. So these are ambrotypes in 1854. And what an ambrotype is, is a um, thin negative on a glass. And when you put a dark background behind it, it switches it from positive to negative. Again, because you have to have the ambrotype and the dark background, it's going to be found in a case. This poor case is um, missing its lid. Um, the things I'm using today are part of my use collection. Uh, so they're probably, they're not always in the best condition, which is these poor girls, they're so cute. And they're unidentified, which is why they have um, found new life in our use collection. This is the structure of a glass, of an amber type. You can see that the top part is actually the glass. And then you have the collodion. And collodion is kind of a sticky plant substance rather than a gelatin. Um, and then the silver particles, the sen light sensitive silver particles are kind of floating in that coll a collodion. And oftentimes the collodion, um, which is kind of a soft, not as soft as daguerreotypes, but kind of a softer surface. So a lot of times they will varnish the, the surface of the collodion. And then you have um, the dark background, which is usually, it can be, I've seen lots of things, black paper, velvet, um, lacquer is probably the most common. I've even seen um, dark colored glass, either red or dark purple. Um, for uh, the, the dark backing that switches it from negative to positive. These are the parts of the ambrotype, very similar to the parts of a daguerreotype. You'll start off with that um, exterior um, border, which is usually a thin brass. Um, I actually have an example here. Let me see if I can pop it apart. I should have popped it apart beforehand. Um, and then it's going to have that die cut frame, which is that brass frame. Here we go. So you have this. Brass wrapping that goes around the edges to hold all the pieces together. You'll have your die cut frame. It's also usually brass. And then a dark cloth background. This one's missing its dark cloth background because it's missing its amber type. And then, um, and then usually a piece of glass. And then the outer protective case, which in this case is also broken. And they all form the all together. They form the amber type. It's often common for amber types to be uh, colored. I don't know if you can see, but this lady, her little buttons on her dress are gilded, which just means like little pieces of gold have gone, uh, they put on the buttons of her dress. 
you'll see rouge cheeks and lips are um, common. Uh, buttons, watch chains, pendants, and brooches are often gilded. Um, and they can be fully colorized as well. Um, they usually do that with some sort of watercolor. Um, they're usually found in cases like daguerreotypes and are often mistaken for them. Um, the image will always appear will um, appear negative when light is transferred through the glass. So if you have a a pen light or a cell phone camera um, light, if you put put it real close so that you can actually kind of look through that and see the background. A lot of the times you can identify the ambrotype by the damage that is happening to the dark background. It'll destroy the positive negative effect. Um, this one here, it's hard to see, but if you look through their gloves or wish you could look through their gloves, um, you can actually see the background, um, the backing has started to flake away and it's kind of disrupted that positive negative tech. Um, effect. Unlike daguerreotypes, you can actually take these apart and replace the backing. But um, that's kind of an advanced skill, so you might want to talk to a conservator before you do that. Um, store them in a cool, dry place as well. And like daguerreotypes, they should be placed in their custom little phase boxes. Tin types, everybody's favorite. I love tin types, they're so cute. They were patented by Hamilton Smith in 1856. They're also known as ferrotypes, which is actually his proper name because there's no tin involved in this. Um, the negative is supported on a dark lacquered thin piece of iron or thin iron sheet. It's very similar to the process of amber types, but instead of the amber type is on glass and tin type is on this thin iron sheet. Um, they were considered functionally dead after about 1900, but they became this kind of novelty thing that you can find up until the 30s. And even today, people are producing um, uh, uh, tin types because of this really high quality. There's no negative, so it is a direct process. Um, and when you have a negative, you know, your print is a copy, so sometimes you lose details. But when you have a direct positive, there's no in-between steps. So you have all these really fine details and um, uh, great uh, coloration. Um, Tintypes were a lot lighter and less costly to manage. They could be sold for pennies or less, uh, making pho photography universally available. Unlike daguerreotypes or ambrotypes, which daguerreotypes could cost um, an average person almost a month's wage, daguerreotypes could cost almost a week's wage, and tintypes were like pennies. So tintypes finally were able to take photography out of elite or upper middle class people and actually bring it down to um, a much wider audience. The camera was much lighter and easier to handle. Um, and also they wouldn't shatter like the glass, um, like the glass images. They became super popular during the Civil War because tintypes could be mailed back to their mothers or their sweethearts um, in their fancy new uniforms with little uh, with um, little damage to them. Although you have to be kind of careful with um, reading Civil War images. Uh, because photographers often had a trunk of props to make those um, soldiers with lesser ranks look more important. So you'll see like um, a infantry person with epaulets or a gun that they would never have carried or a sword that they wouldn't have carried. Um, so it's careful, don't assume their rank by what they're wearing in their tintypes. Um, 
like amber types because these can also be colored or tinted. I've seen some really beautifully tinted um, uh, tint types that look like color photo photographs. There we go. So this is the structure of the tint type. You see the bottom portion is that um, iron, oftentimes they lacquered both the top and the bottom of the tin type. It is also made with that collodion and oftentimes also has a varnish on top. It is sometimes difficult to tell a tin type from an ambro type. This is a cased tin type. This is a cased ambro type. And just looking at the two, it's sometimes really hard to tell the difference. There are a couple of tricks. If you take a magnet and it doesn't hold, it's an ambro type. But if the magnet does hold, it's likely a tin type. But you have to be careful because sometimes ambro types used um, a thin piece of metal as their backing. So it might be sticking to the metal backing rather than the actual ambro type. But if it doesn't stick, it's definitely an ambro type. Uh, deterioration of a tin type um, off and off or is the best uh, clues. You can see this one. Let's see if I can get, do I have a pointer? Where's my pointer? Um, you can see at the top portion of this example, you see the little flakings, the emulsion has started to flake off of this poor thing. Well, Tin types are often easily bent, which will cause the varnish to crack. And once that um, metal is exposed to air, it does what metal does when it's exposed to air or iron does when it's exposed to air, it starts to rust. Um, and because tin types were meant to be handled, the surface is often bent and scratched. Um, and then the, even the slightest humidity changes can cause that rust to appear. Sometimes the surface um, is varnished and the varnish can turn yellow or darken when exposed to strong light, which is what's happened to this one. The varnish, you can barely see the image, the varnish has turned very, very dark and um, is making the poor image look worse than it probably is. Um, you can, they should be kept in storage envelopes um, to protect against light and humidity. And you can also add a backing to help with that support. This is one that I've done. It's got these little strips here to help hold it in place. And then it's on a piece of cardboard, which I've then just placed into an enclosure. Okay. Clean up my work surface here for a second. Okay, so I'm gonna move on to negatives. Negatives allowed photographers to make unlimited copies. The images were no longer one of a kind and could be shared, sold, and collected. The earliest negatives were actually on paper, but these are very, very rare um, and usually in pretty poor condition. It's unlikely, I don't have in my collection, which is pretty large and vast um, of a million photographs, we do not have any calotypes. Um, so the most, the earliest form, one of the most commercially viable early forms was collodion wet plates. They were invented in 1851, and they also used collodion, which is that sticky um, uh, plant-based substrate. They were usually used from about 1851 till about the mid 1880s. Um, although some people used them beyond that, butcher. Solomon Butcher, um, who's famous for taking the sod house photos in Custer County. He used wet plates for a lot of his work and he worked from um, in the mid 1880s to the late 1880s. Um, and I just think that like if a photographer was used to a method, they just kind of continued on to that method. So there's no hard dates um, when people 
used or didn't use. So um, collodion is, 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 um, can be dissolved in alcohol. So it's very important to keep those away from alcohol. Um, it is applied to the gla glass using a binder layer for the photosensitive silver compounds. The plate is coated by hand and placed into the camera while wet. Um, you usually use that process to um, identify it. This is a wet plate. So it was the piece of glass was the substrate was poured onto the piece of glass and then the um, photographer will swirl the glass around or the um, emulsion around until it coated the um, piece of glass. You'll often see with an amber with a with a wet plate. You'll often see like where the photographer you can see like this corner down here is pretty much blank. That's probably really where the photographer held the negative while he swirled it, while he swirled the um, emulsion, coat, emulsion coating onto it. You can also, if you looked at this very closely, which um, obviously you can't right now, you would actually be able to see like little tidal waves um, as well, which are just kind of like uneven, the unevenness of the surface of the emulsion. So this is the structure of a collodion wet plate. You'll see the glass, the um, albumin or collodion, and then the silver floating in the collodion. And oftentimes, again, this collodion is very soft. So they would also varnish this as well to help protect this. Um, photographers would keep their negatives on file and not um, usually try not to destroy them, but they would keep them on file so that they could sell, continue to sell um, copies of prints of that to the families and, and um, other people. So um, the advantages, there's and advantages and disadvantages of it. The advantages is that it had greater sensitivity. Exposure could only, unlike the, those daguerreotypes, the exposure could just be seconds rather than minutes. The disadvantage is that everything had to be done while the collodion was still wet. Once it was dry, it was impermeable to the processing solutions. So. A lot, of collodion, a lot of collodion things were mostly done in studios. It took a brave or brave photographer or a crazy one in Butcher's case, um, or not a crazy one, but he wasn't crazy, but a very adventurous one like Butcher to go and make these out in um, the open air. So when Butcher was traveling with his, taking those photographs out in, um, Custer County, he was traveling with an entire dark room in his wagon, um, which included boxes of um, uncoated glass plate negatives, all the collect, all the chemicals needed um, to make the collodion, and then all the chemicals needed to process the collodion. Um, and it all had to be done within minutes of the camera exposure for it to, so that the, the wet plate didn't um, dry. So because the emulsion is so soft, it's usually varnish. Um, and this helps protect it against humidity and pollutants, but it's still pretty easily scratched in a braided. Um, it's supported on glass. So obviously it's very vulnerable to breakage. It's best stored in envelopes in correctly sized boxes. Um, paper enclosures add added protections against um, changes to humidity and pollutants. They should be, um, all glass plates should be stored vertically along the long edge and never flat. Um, if you stacked a bunch of glass plates on top of this, the bottom one would break and you don't want that. That's why we store them vertically. Oh my goodness, so heavy. This is a box of wet plates. which probably weighs about 30 pounds. Uh, 
Um, glass plates should be stored either in four flap negative enclosures, which is probably what I would recommend for um, wet plates. Um, they should be acid free, lignin free, unbuffered, um, and they should always pass the PAT test, which we'll talk more about later in the program. This, the four flap negative enclosures, because you aren't taking them in and out of the envelope, helps reduce um, abrasions, um, especially on that soft surface of the um, uh, collodions. The boxes should be um, acid free, lignin free, unbuffered, and attached and pass the PAT test. Uh, and it's also really good to have rigid dividers to keep the plates vertical um, and uh, not caught, not have slumping of the negatives. Um, it'll also help uh, reduce the pressure um, of the negatives. Next up are gelatin dry plates. They were most popular from 1878 to 1940. Unlike collodion, gelatin negatives were dry. They could retain their um, sensitivity for months before use um, and could be developed long after exposures. They could be manufactured industrially. My arms aren't that long. They could be in, uh, manufactured industrially. And they're very, very, and you didn't need to have, you didn't need to transport your dark room with you when you went. You just had to keep your negatives um, out of the light. And then you could go back to your dark room and process the dry plates. These are very, very, very common in um, collections. Unlike wet plates are a lot less common, dry plates are very common. Here's the structure of the gelatin diet by gelatin plate. You can see the glass, the gelatin, and then that silver kind of um, floating in the gelatin. I always like to think of it as kind of like a, like a jello salad with fruit. I'm from Minnesota, so we had a lot of jello salads with fruit floating in it. Um, so that's, that's the structure of the, um, the negative. Of course, because it is broke, a glass is often, it can uh, easily be broken or cracked. Another thing that will happen with them is delamination. There's a pretty extreme place case of delamination. And that's just when either the glass is improperly prepared or um, the glass has started to deteriorate or the it has been ex extreme uh, exposed to extreme humidity and the emulsion will just start to flake away from the, um, the piece of glass. Most likely we, we usually, the proper term is delamination, but mostly we just refer to this as flaking. This is a pretty extreme case of it. My guess is this one was probably caused by poor preparation of glass as well as exposure to high humidities. It's good to have examples like this in my use collection so you can see what it is. Um, all gelatin photographs, negatives and prints are subject to oxidation, um, which manifests in either fading, yellowing, yellowing or silver mirroring. Silver mirroring is that bluish metallic appearance. It often appears kind of along the edges of the glass plate, and it's usually caused by poor storage conditions. Um, often store, they're often stored in the um, that poor quality boxes. And I'm sure you're probably familiar with these kind of boxes. These are what the negatives were shipped out to photographers in. And photographers often recycled these boxes by storing their negatives in the, these. Um, and they are, of course, not archival. And this poor, this poor quality um, cardboard will off gas and cause, start to cause the um, silver mirroring. High humidity levels will also cause the gelatin to soften. And then the silver particles float to the surface. And once that sil sil silver is sitting on the surface, it does what silver does, which is tarnish. So again, it's just like that, that jello salad. Um, if you have those little pieces of fruit cocktails, um, you know, in your lime jello, 
and it, you kind of expose it, it doesn't quite set right, all the fruit will come to the top of it. Um, and that's what's happening when, it, when the uh, high humidity levels happen. Gelatin plates, um, again, you wanna support that glass. It's very easily broken. Um, and also choose an environment that is cool and dry. Um, do not, but do not put it into cold storage, which we'll talk more in a minute about. And then you want to store them in um, envelopes and boxes that are correctly sized. Uh, I forgot to show you this one. This one, um, the people had the best intentions. They put pieces of tissue paper uh, between each negative um, to help protect that soft surface and keep it from scratching. The problem is, is that even while they tried to do their best to store it, they stored it in a very high humidity level. And um, the, it got so humid and the gelatin got so soft that that um, tissue paper stuck to the emulsion and is now permanently stuck to the emulsion. So you want to avoid um, high levels of uh, humidity. Okay. Again, store them in correctly sized boxes. Paper enclosures add protection against humidity changes and pollutants. And then they also should be stored vertically, like I showed you in that box before, which is too heavy to pick up for a second time. On to, um, now we're moving away from glass negatives to um, flexible negatives or plastic negatives. Nitrate negatives, which get a pretty bad rap, were commonly used from um, about 1910 to about 1939. Although they were manufactured as early as 1888 um, and into the 1950s, but they're most common from about 1910 to about 1939. Um, they are used for uh, used for sheet film um, as well as motion picture film, and they usually have the word nitrate stamped along the edge. They are very, very flammable, and they can even burn underwater. Once they are ignited, nitrate fires are almost impossible to put out. And the toxic gas that they produce while burning um, is lethal. Nitrates are inherently unstable, which means that we can slow down the de um, deterioration process, but we cannot stop the deterioration process. Here's the structure of the nitrate negative. And my examples here. Um, you have that plastic film. It's either nitrocellulose cellulose or cellulose acetate polyester. Um, this is the structure for all uh, flexible negatives. The only difference is that what they're using for that plastic film. Um, and then gelatin and silver on uh, silver floating in that gelatin. Um, nitrate is, um, unless they are kept in very low temperatures, the cellulose nitrate self destructs at unpredictable rates. Um, as it deteriorates, it gives off an acidic byproduct off acidic byproducts, nitric oxide, oxidate, oh, sorry, nitric oxide and nitrogen dioxide. These gases are deep lung ir irritants um, and repeated exposure can cause eye irritation, rashes, sores on face and necks, vertigo, nausea, headaches, swollen glands and respiratory um, irritations. Um, also, um, damage, it can also cause damage to the materials around it. It can cause um, other photographs, photographic prints to become embrittled and um, film, uh, in both the uh, paper and film. And the community, um, the damage can cause by many organic um, materials and metals. So how do I identify a nitrate negative? Usually along one of the edges, you can see here in the photograph there, I can't really see on my negative. I can see it. There is along the outer edge, it'll often be stamped with nitrate on it. 
look for the V-shaped notch code on the sheet film from um, Kodak prior to 1950. Um, let's see, how do I get to... Um, the, and then the film will usually be a slightly yellow or tan color without deterioration. So this one's kind, I don't know if you can kind of see that it's kind of got that sepia tone to it. What to do with nitrate film? Well, first of all, store it separately from other photographic materials in a well-vented area, um, and then maintain a stable environment. Determine uh, deterioration uh, is highly dependent on temperature and relative humidity. So you want to store it um, between 32 and 40 degrees Fahrenheit with a uh, relative humidity of 20 to 30 percent. The best method is to store it in a freezer in cold storage. This helps slow down the decomposition, but does not stop it. Um, and, the, and then into special um, archival cold storage materials are required. We're going to talk about cold storage a little more later on. So if you have questions about that, hopefully I can answer those in um, the later part of the program. Always use three layers of protection for um, negative or for um, nitrate negatives. Put them into indiv individual sleeves, usually unbuffered, and then in an archival box, and then place the box. Um, you wrap up the box in um, layers of protection. This box has been prepped for cold storage. It has a internal plastic layer, and then this external um, layer of plastic. So it's actually got two plates. Um, pieces of plastic on it. One is a vapor barrier and the other piece is just a regular very thick sheet of plastic. Okay. Never seal nitrate negatives into airtight conditions. The gases and heat caused by the judiciary relation needs to be allowed to escape. Use paper enclosures and boxes. And it's best to reformat them either as copy negatives or to digitize them, which is probably the most common nowadays, and then create copy prints. The next step is, oh, I forgot to show you, this is a nitrate negative that has started to curl and deteriorate. And this is what severe deterioration starts to look like. Um, eventually, this bluish sheen, the substance will continue to deteriorate and turn into almost a powdery substance. Okay. Crunchy acetate negatives here. Acetate negatives were used from um, the 1925s and continue to be used rarely. But I see mostly we're switching to polyester in the uh, 1950s and 60s, usually about the 1960s, we see a switch over to the more stable polyester film. Cellulose, um, it can either be cellulose acetate, diacetate, triacetate, and then there's other forms that are less common. Oftentimes they will have um, safety marked along their edge. Um, which just means that unlike the nitrate negatives, which were very easily to, easy to burn and cause uncontrollable fires, these don't, don't burn as e they don't burn, and hence that they're safety film. They do have a lot of stability problems. Their deterioration is autocatalytic, which is the word of the day, autocatalytic, which means once the deterioration has begun, the um, degradation process will cause further damage. It can also trigger um, acetate negatives that are stored in the same box as the deteriorating negative to start to deteriorate. So the bad negative is giving off this gas that is causing the new the good negatives to start to their, their deterioration process. The plastic substrates um, usually become acidic, shrink, and then give off a very strong vinegar smell. Um, it smells like rotten pickles to me. When stored in poor environments, um, like high humidity and high temperature, 
or exposed to acidic vapors, they will undergo a chemical reaction to form acidic, um, acidic acid. The cause, it causes the substrate to become very brittle, acidic, brittle, and to start to shrink. There are six levels of um, progress of deterioration. The first level is what we like to see is no deterioration, but eventually they'll start to deteriorate and they'll start to begin to curl and they'll turn blue like the photograph there. This one started to turn blue here. And they'll start to smell like um, that vinegar smell. Oftentimes this is referred to vinegar syndrome, but you also see that it's starting to warp it's not real flat. You can see kind of that it's starting to warp here and it smells very bad. Um, but then you start to see bubbles and crystals filming on the, the film in stage five. And finally in stage six, you'll see the photographs start to form these channels. And the channels are just like the substrate is flaking away, um, is shrinking um, and starting to cause the film to, or it's causing the substrate to channel. There is a new process that they have been doing for a few years now where um, some photo conservators are floating the emulsion off of these channeling negatives um, and then putting it onto new substrate. Now that's something that only a, a photo conservator could do. And it's not an easy or cheap um, solution. Polyester film was um, is our saving grace. They are most present from about eight, 1965 until present. Um, when, view, when viewed under polarizing filters, the film is identified by um, a kind of rainbow pattern of colors. They are much, much more stable um, than nitrate or acetate films um, and much, much easier to care for. Okay, I think I'm gonna um, take, uh, take questions about night negatives right now. And then um, I guess if you have questions about early photography before we move on to prints. Yeah, so if anybody has any questions, feel free to type them in the chat. This is Kelly again, and then I will ask those questions for you. Okay, if we don't have any questions right now about negatives or direct positives, We'll move on to prints. I'm gonna pause here to get a drink of water though. Okay, let's talk about prints. Prints are what we do to, uh, with all these negatives. The earliest form are salted paper prints. Um, in my collection of a million photographs, I have one example of a salted paper print. They are very, very rare. They were produced from the 1840s until the 1860s. They um, were a positive photo photograph um, printed from a negative. The support material is actually just ordinary paper and it's printed out solely by natural light. The negative is placed in contact with sensitive paper and exposed to sunlight. The print is usually a very matte surface with warm image tones um, with either red brick or purple uh, tones, depending on how it was processed and how the paper was sized. It is a one layer process. The image appears embedded into the paper fibers. Um, since they're not very common, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on them. Albumin prints are very, very common, and they're probably one of your most common um, types of photographs in your collection. They were used from about the 1850s until about 1900. 
Um, the first albumin print was presented to the world at the French Academy of Sciences in 1850. And it was a process that was quickly adapted by photographers. Um, and it began to replace, be, be replaced by the industry um, by about 1885-ish. So how do you make a amber type or amber type? An albumin in print, it's a pretty, pretty one. Um, you take a very thin sheet of paper and first coat it with egg whites and salt. Um, and then it's floated into a nit uh, silver nitrate bath to make those, um, to make it sensitive to light. And then the image is created by printing it under the negative and sunlight. Um, the finished picture is usually is always fixed, washed, and often gold toned before it is mounted. There's a structure of an albumin print. You can see there's a piece of paper, the albumin um, or the egg whites with the silver kind of floating within those the albumin. Um, albumin prints. Ooh, that was my fault. Albumin prints are often um, sepia toned with a um, slight glossy surface. Um, an unfaded albumin print will have, like this one, um, kind of purpley brown tones rather than sepia. Because there's an abrada layer, um, the prints are always mounted. The paper fibers are usually visible through the albumin. The paper is always, albumin prints are always mounted because that piece of paper that they float the emulsion on or the albumin on is so thin. And then you put, coat it with just one side of, um, of that albumin. It'll roll up into a very, very tight and roll up very, very tight if it's unmounted. So that it's always glued to a, um, a mount or a backing. Signs of deterioration can be often helpful in determining uh, and identifying albumin prints. Um, you usually see kind of a yellowing and a localized or overall fading to the image. The image on the screen um, is, of, is the earliest known photograph of chimney rock, by the way. Um, and then the types of mount, Mount, uh, types of mounts for albumin prints are most common, either a little tiny carte de visite, a carte de visite, carte de visite, or CVD, or CDV, sorry, CDV. Um, carte de visites are pretty common from in the 1850s, 1860s, 1870s. We don't see a lot of Victoria cards. Cabinet cards are very common. This is kind of an unusual shaped ca um, cabinet card. Um, panel cards are probably the next most common. And then either imperial or stereo cards as well. Uh, on to Claudian prints. All right, so these were um, available in the 1860s, but they didn't really become popular until the late 1880s. They were the chief commercial pro um, portrait medium between 18. 95 and 1910. They are used with this, they are, they are made with the same sticky cellulose nit nitrocellulose emulsion as ambrotypes and wet plate negatives. Um, and it's mixed with a silver chloridine and coated on the piece of paper. Here's what um, the structure of the um, looks like. They will have a Bereta layer, which is that kind of silver or um, biranium, biranium sulfate layer. And that's oftentimes, uh, that is a very kind of white color. Um, so you see deterioration like this one. I don't know if you can see that, but she's got some scrapes right across her hand and you see that real bright Bereta layer is visible. Um, through that deterioration. Surfaces can be matte, glossy, or semi-glossy, um, kind of like an albumin print. The white areas general, generally lack a, the yellowish cast of an albumin print. 
Um, and they're usually toned with gold or platinum and show little to no fading. And they have no silver mirroring. Um, gelatin silver prints are, here we go. very, very common. You can either have printed out process, which um, the image is made from direct light. Um, it's kind of a warmer tone, usually very glossy, often fades to a yellow, and they appeared in the late 1860s. Develop um, out process. The visible image is made through a process of a chemical developer rather than a reaction to direct light. And it's usually got a cooler, or blue tone to it, um, unless it's been toned. Oftentimes, it's got a gold tone. So they'll use a gold toning, um, and it's made in, made either by co um, direct contact printing or enlargement from the negatives. That's what a the structure of a developed out gelatin print looks like. You'll see the paper, the Breda layer, gelatin, and um, silver. By about 1905, sales of developing out papers outsold printed out papers. Um, and many re there's re many reasons for commercial photographers preferred it and had lower cost. It was faster, it was a more reliable production. Amateurs um, attract were attracted to it because it did not need um, sunlight to expose. And most black and white photographs in the 20th century are silver gelatin prints. Here's a, some, some other examples of silver gelatin prints like this, oops. There's a snapshot that would be a silver gelatin, kind of a postcard. You can see this one's been kind of toned or poorly processed. So it's got a yellowish tint to it. All right, on to cyanotypes, which are kind of my one of my favorite photographs just because they're so weird looking. Um, it was developed by uh, John Herschel in 1842, um, but most of these date from the late, between about 1880s and 1920s. It's based on light, sense, light sensitive iron salts rather than silver salts. Um, and then using Prussian blue, blue and um, Trimble's blue. It is basically the same process of a blueprint um, and it's easily identified by its bright blue color. There's the structure of it. You'll see that the blue pigments are basically embedded into that top surface of the paper. So if you look at this really closely using like a loop, you'd be actually be able to see the paper fiber. Um, exposure to uh, light chemical, light chemically changes the image to um, colorless form, but you can, un you, unlike other types of photographs where light damage is permanent, these actually can reverse itself slightly when it's put back into the dark, uh, the blue color will be um, restored a little bit. Um, images are subject to um, alkaline, um, so never store them in buffered enclosures. They'll turn a very pale brown and lose almost all the details and densities. Okay, so they always store them either in unbuffered or plastic enclosures. Latinotypes are um, another one. They were uh, another type of photographs. They were formed in about 1879, um, and they were manufactured well past uh, World War, well about until World War One, um, and then they kind of dropped off in World War One because um, platinum was being needed for the war effort, so photographers weren't really uh, had uh, access to platinum. But they have been revived since then, from about 19 in the 1960s. Uh, because the photographers like to coat their own paper and um, platino types were an easy way to do that. Um, they were widely used for commercial processes um, after the turn of the century, so from about 1900 to about 1918, 1920. 
and um, with a wide, they have a wide variety of um, tones. They can range from a gray tone to um, kind of a, uh, they can even be like gold tone to almost a sepia comb. They are among, they're considered among the most beautiful and most permanent images. You can usually identify them um, because the paper is, uh, oh, I'm sorry, the genotypes or platinum prints, the paper is, sensi is sensitized with platinum salts rather than silver salts. The image is embedded into the paper fibers, which makes them highly stable and resistant fading. Um, toning is generally either um, silver to black, but warm tones are all can also be achieved. You can often identify the um, the uh, a platino type by a ghost print. So what happens is if the plat platinum print was touches the surface of another thing, um, either the back of another photograph that it's being stored with or sometimes they're found in folders. What will happen is that this ghost image on the other photograph, not the platinum print, but the photo that was touching the surface of the platinum print will um, create this kind of ghost image. It's not the emulsion um, transferring to the back of the um, other photograph. It is actually the platinum salts burning or deteriorating the paper backing of the um, whatever it's touching. And it's usually, um, it's not a transfer print, it's actually the burning of the paper fibers. All right, on to early color photography. Um, that ribbon right there is actually the earliest known color photograph taken in 1861. Um, Color prints are made up as a three color process. It's usually red, uh, um, through red, green, and blue filters. Um, transparencies are made from that um, by projecting it through those same filters. Um, all color photography. Oops. So um, the first color negative or was, um, produced or released in 1839, um, but World War II kind of delayed that commercial expansion. Although you can find um, examples of uh, World War II photographs. Um, World War II color photographs, which are pretty cool. You can Google them and find them. Um, Positive printing papers were released commercially, um, but they were pretty, the cost was pretty high for processing the prints. Um, so it kind of had a very slow start. So even it was, though it was available in the, by the 1940s, color photog photography wasn't really popular until the 18, 1960s and 1970s when the cost of the photo materials um, decreased and then color photos obviously started to replace all black and white photos in the mass market. Um, color negative is also a three layer process, one laid on top of the other. The bottom layer is yellow, then the next layer is magenta and then cyan on top. Um, modern film is uh, have more complex layers. We'll have some modern films will have a more complex layering system. Cold storage is recommended for colored negatives. There's a structure of a color negative. You have that polyester or um, triacetate bottom, and then you have the three layers of color. You can see the blue, the magenta, and then the yellow on top. Color prints um, usually consist of three gelatin layers, um, but here the, uh, the order of the colors are reversed. Magenta is on the bottom, or cyan is on the bottom, magenta and then yellow. So a lot of people ask why their images are turning yellow, but it's not actually turning yellow. What's happening is the magenta and cyan layers fade faster than the yellow layer. 
Um, so the yellow layer um, is just what's left um, after the magenta and cyan layers start to fade. Modern photographs have um, a resin coated, you often have a resin coated backing, which can make them um, difficult to write on the back of them. But I've got a solution for that, which we'll talk about when we get to labeling photographs. Um, again, cold storage is recommended for colored prints. This is the structure of a colored print. It's very similar to um, the uh, color negative, but the order of the colors is reversed, yellow, magenta, and then blue on top. All right, so um, we're, I'll take questions on prints, negatives, direct positives, history of photography, all that first part of the session. And um, now. You do have um, one question in here from Kathy Alts. Do you have advice for preserving old scrapbooks with various kinds of prints pasted to paper? Yes. Um, and we'll talk about that during our, the section on issues um, and how to solve those issues. So hang tight, Kathy. I will cover, cover that and tell you what to do. All right. Yeah, I don't see any more questions. Okay, I was expecting a lot more questions. <laughs> You're doing such a good job. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, so on to preservation and oh, storage. Okay. Sorry, oh. can I interrupt, Karen? We did get um, a question from Audrey Cotters. What is an aura tone? What? I don't know. It's a... Um, Audrey is spelling it O-R-O-T-O-N-E. I'm not familiar with that process, I'm sorry to say. Or a tone. I'd, I'd have to look that one up. Um, there's a great book um, that has all of the processes in it, um, photographs of the past and present, and then also um, preventing conservation, preventative conservation in photography collections is a great book too. Um, Laura, I will be, um, um, tomorrow I will be putting up, or not tomorrow, Wednesday, I will be putting up um, a copy of my slides as well as several handouts as well. So yes, this will be um, available for download um, after the conference. Okay, on to preservation and storage, which is probably what you guys are most interested in, but I'm a photo nerd, so you had to sit through that first part um, because I like that stuff. So let's talk about what's damaging our photos. Temperature and humidity, light, pests and other bad things, poor storage and improper handling. And we'll talk um, about each one, of the, we're gonna break down each one of these and talk about it. Relative um, humidity, which is the amount of air in uh, amount of water in the air, it's the single most important environmental um, factor that is affecting your photographs. The ideal RH in an archive is about forty percent. I have to admit, we we can't even even we can't achieve that, but um, forty percent is ideal for photographs. But it's really really dry for um, other materials. Like you would not store paper artifacts at forty percent. Um, because that's too dry and it causes embrittlement of like your manuscripts or paper collections. But photographs like it dry. Low levels, um, something between zero and 30% can cause photographs to become brittle and shrink unevenly. And high levels, 50 to 100%, can cause oxidation, fading, and the spread of fungus. So what is most important about relative humidity is not achieving that for perfect 40%, but it, um, actually avoiding extreme fluctuations. What you don't want is to have high humidity one day and low humidity the next day, and this up down. If you can just find a humidity level that you can keep within a few degrees, um, that's, that's the best. Um, Effects of RH will cause 
rapidly escalating levels of damage to prints when exposed to high levels of RH. Um, 50 to 60% um, increases the moisture content in albumin and prints in gelatin, which, um, And then anything above 60% will actually cause an increase in moisture um, and content. Well, the, I'm sorry, 50 to 60% um, is okay, but it's not devastating, but it's, it's, it's okay. Anything above 60% will cause rapid and rapid increase into moisture content and will cause a threat of um, some pretty serious damage. The higher the humidity, the faster the image fades. And once fading, occurs, the damage cannot be reversed. Even short periods of high humidity can cause damage, like you saw with that glass plate negative that had the tissue paper stuck to it. Um, and then humidity levels between 65 and 70% will cause the spread of fungus. Temperature um, will help is, so we know like, from our chemistry back in the day that if you raise the temperature or even cooking, if you raise the temperature, it causes the chemical reaction to speed up. So heat increases chemical, um, chemical reactions. Um, and the chemical reactions and deterioration is basically the chemical breakdown of a photograph. An ideal temperature for an archive is between 60 and 65 degrees, again, so cold, but anything below 65 degrees um, is no longer comfortable for people to work in for long periods of time. Just try to keep it as low as possible without raising the RH level and causing condensation when moved from to a warmer environment. Our, um, our archives sit about, about 68 degrees, 67 to 68 degrees. Still cold. All right, temperature and humidity, relative humidity work together. They are um, the keys to preservation and they um, are interrelated. Temperature determines how much water the air can hold. Warm air holds more water than cold air. In a closed system, like a room or a building, a rise in temperature will lower the RH and cooling the air will drive the temperature up. Combination of a high temperature and high humidity is one of the worst things that can happen to your collections. It can cause the emulsion to become too sticky. So what to do? Well, um, use proper storage and housing by having that three layers of protection, the envelope the and the box, and um, then a good shelving system will actually help um, will actually help stay, create that stabilized environment. Keep track and measure your um, relative humidity levels, either using um, hydrothermograph. You can pick up these little digital temperature and relative humidity um, gadgets pretty much anywhere. Um, they don't record but you can actually create a log if you, you can't afford a little data logger. Um, you can create a log to help kind of monitor your swings in temperature and humidity level um, as well. And by creating a log using this, it'll help you see where your problems are. Like on rainy days, your temperature, your humidity might spike. So you might need to do um, make some adjustments. Um, and then in the winter, you'll see your uh, relative humidity drop because it's winter and it's very, very dry. Oops. There's some examples of hydrothermographs um, and uh, data loggers. So low cost or no cost improvements that you can do for climate control. Um, keep the winter heat low. Seal the windows in storage areas, line windows with aluminum foil, and then seal them um, completely with uh, like gypsum whiteboard or plastic. Keep the outdoor, keep outside doors and windows closed and use weather stripping. 
Um, block radiant heat from radi radiators, uh, which can cause like uh, lower, like to lower the humidity levels, get it too dry. And keep equipment at um, one level 24 hours a day. So even though you might save some money by turning your heat down at night or turning it down when people aren't in the building, um, those fluctuations will actually cause more damage to your photograph collection. Um, and then separate collections that need special conditions, um, such as like nitrate and acetate negatives that need and color negatives that need cold storage. All right, so we're gonna talk about mold outbreaks. Mold is a form of fungal growth. growth. It's one of the most serious um, sources of damage in library archives and museum collections, as well as a potential health risk to the people caring for the collections. Uh, mold is attracted to starches such as plant gums found in adhesive sizing and clothing, proteins such as leather, parchment, gelatin, animal glues, and cellulose, um, which is all parts of a photograph. Mold can attack books, documents, art on paper, photograph, prints, and negatives, and other photographic, uh, other paper-based artifacts. As mold grows, it digests the collection material um, and compromises and weakens them. Many molds contain a color substance um, capable of staining the material that they grow on. Um, and once the item has been attacked by mold, it will be more subsist, um, subsist, subsist, it'll, uh, mold will be more uh, likely to happen again in the future. Um, the weakened organic material absorbs water more e easily and resulting in an ongoing cycle of damage. Mold needs two things to grow, an organic host to grow on, so paper, adhesive, cloth, wood, and leather, something I mentioned that photographs can be part of. Um, and then it also needs a superficial soiling um, deposits like skin cells, fibers, external dirt, oily substance, and, or industrial pl um, pollutants, um, as well as moisture. So organic host and moisture. Uh, outdoor, the outdoor environment can, uh, um, should be considered as a factor for mold growth. Outside air is continually circul circulated through most buildings HVAC systems. So just be aware that the increased possibility of mold growth happen, might happen during certain times of year when the temperatures begin to drop and the amount of moisture in the air tends to get higher. Mold bloom. Mold spores exist in every environment at all times. The most um, a sudden mold bloom in a collection indicates that there is an environmental change has occurred, causing the um, spores to germinate. Such concentrated outbreaks can be caused by triggers, including faulty HVAC systems, heating, venting, ventilating, and air conditioning, water leaks, flooding, and other um, climatic changes. In incidences of water damage to collections or building materials, action within 24 to 48 hours is required to prevent mold growth. If mold, uh, mold bloom is suspected in your collection, um, human safety and proper personal protection equipment should be, used, should be the first priority. So take care of yourself and then take care of your collection. Mold is most commonly um, at, most commonly attacks paper-based materials um, and will uh, germinate and grow at a relative humidity once relative humidity heat reaches or exceeds 70 to 75 percent and remains at that level for several several days. High heat temperatures, poor air circulation, dim to no light, and um, accumulation of soiling, as, soiling assists and accelerate the growth of mold once it started to germinate. But only high humidity levels of environment and moisture um, can, uh, continents of the, uh, will initiate the uh, and sustain mold growth. The EPA recommends maintaining an indoor relative humidity below 60%, ideally 30 to 50 for paper-based and photograph materials. 
Mold will stop growing and become inactive once the RH drops below 70%. So first step is to do a in-house um, assessment, determine the um, observed problem, uh, which is gonna be mold, and then check out the temperature and humidity levels in the area. Um, are there visible signs of water damage um, and under what circumstances the mold, um, under some circumstances mold can grow with, uh, occur within 24 to 48 hours. Does the material feel damp? Um, smell musty or moldy, um, and uh, and then make some decisions on how, how to proceed. Um, small to moderate outbreaks involving a limited number of items can often be handled in house, um, and is not highly if it's not a highly toxic mold. Um, Outside assistance should be determined, depend on the extent of the outbreak, the toxic, toxicity of the mold, um, the resources of the institution, and the type of material that is affected. The EPA um, have, uh, have some uh, guidelines for helping clean up the method um, and give you an idea of what we mean by the size of the outbreak. So responding to the outbreak, use common sense and consider health and safety first and always. A severe mold outbreak can be um, extremely hazardous to your health. And if the situation does not appear safe, do not attempt to touch it, move or clean the materials without any outside professional help. If there is a small outbreak, and if you are familiar with emergency mold response, do as much as you can safe, safely, do as much as you safely can do. Determine the cause of the outbreak, isolate the materials, and restrict access to the objects in the room, and then take steps to lower the temperature and relative humidity. You can install or empty um, dehumidifiers frequently. Consult print and web um, resources to um, get a better idea. Once, um, and then next, how to proceed. Um, whoop, that is actually a copy of the same. I think I went back and so forth. So when you're bringing in new collections, it's a good idea to isolate them in case they are um, have been exposed to high humidity levels and uh, could uh, cause a mold outbreak. Um, your accession protocol should provide a time period for inspection and observation in a quarantine room. Um, which is uh, isolated, ideally physically sealed, but that's not really possible for most of us, including me. Um, and then quarantine the inspection um, to, and then inspect the quarantine items to identify any problematic materials and possible infestations of the object packing material. Um, the effect of materials can be um, treated before integrating them into the collection to prevent larger disasters. All right, on to light. Light is our enemy. All light is bad. It causes fading and yellowing. Damage um, from light is permanent and it's accumulative. Ultraviolet light causes the most damage um, and protection from UV light, but just using a UV filter and protection from UV light does not eliminate all the damage. All light on the light spectrum is bad. Some types of images are particularly light sensitive, like albumin prints, cyanotypes, and color images. What to do? Display copies whenever possible. Scanning or photocopying um, your original photographs cause little to no harm um, and a lot less harm than the continued light exposure and handling caused um, by, um, by putting them on display. But try to keep scanning and copying to a minimum. Um, keep the original photographs in the dark as much as possible. If you do want to display an original print, know that light damage is permanent and accumulative. So if even if you put it on display for a little bit and then give it a rest and then put it on display for a little bit, 
that light damage is just going to accumulate over time and fading will never, um, is permanent. But you can take some precautions when displaying an original. Avoid direct sunlight. Choose glass with a UV protection because some protection is better than no protection. And then select archival materials for frames and mats. So that usually means replacing that bad wooden backing um, uh, with something more archival. And then just monitor the fading over time. A lot of times that means taking the print out of the frame to check to see how much um, fading has occurred from uh, the parts that are exposed to light versus the, the edges that aren't um, that are covered by the frame. Pests and other bad things. It's often the result of poor storage and um, conditions. Uh, insects mold outbreaks are um, happen in moist and dark places. Organic material that make up photo photographs are a tasty meal for insects, rodents, and mold. Um, like gelatin, cellulose, and paper. I have a funny story about when I worked at Stir Museum. I shared an office with our um, interpretation director and somebody had dropped off some corn cobs for her. And we had a mouse get in because, you know, Stir Museum is built on this beautiful 200, a uh, 200 acres of um, prairie land. Um, and we had a mouse get in, which was um, not a common problem, but occurred usually in the fall because they're looking for warm places to sleep. Um, so I found the mouse not where the bag of corn was in her office, but I found it back in the photograph collection. So apparently the photograph sounded tastier than the corn for some reason. So just... Um, be on the lookout for insects because they love to eat, uh, insects and rodents, they love to eat photographs. So what types of pests to watch for? Rodents, mold, insects like silverfish, fire brats, common German cockroaches. Um, you can either break them into two categories, things that like to eat your collection and things that like to leave messes behind like rodents, um, mold, and then insects like cockroaches, flies, spiders, wasps, um, I'm sure all of you have experienced having to clean out um, mud dauber wasps nests from the back of something. So what is really important is to have an integrated pest management po um, policy. So this will help prevent photographs from being attacked and damaged. Well, actually your whole collection from being attacked and damaged by um, pests like insects and mold. Um, a lot of people have moved away from having regular chemical um, applications of like pesticides and fungicides. Um, not only is it expensive, but it can also be harmful for your collections. Um, so a lot of um, institutions are going towards a um, just recording the damage and, um, and then watching for outbreak. Among institutions, um, they reported that damage or loss in a two-year period, 27% was resulting was a result of pests. Pests rank among the top five causes of damage or loss for museums and scientific collections. And pests contribute to damage or loss of 27% of all types of institutions, including libraries, archives, and historical, and historical societies. So some common types of pests, brown banded, banded cockroaches, which is the top image, um, they prefer dry environments where they can devour glue and paper. Again, glue and paper make up photo photographs. Um, they can be catastrophic to libraries, archives, and art museums where old books, documents, um, like paint and paintings um, can offer a, like nice little meals for these species of cockroaches. Clothing moths um, probably won't affect your photographs so much, um, but they like to feed off of animal fibers. Um, so sometimes we see like in scrapbooks, we see swatches of clothing and stuff. So you do kind of want to watch out for clothing moths. Um, 
as well. They will affect um, animal pelts, textiles, and taxidermy now mounts are most in, at risk for infection. The next one is silverfish, which is the bottom image. Aren't they nasty looking? Um, they favor um, finished paper, glue, and wallpaper. Um, and they usually venture out at night to feast on those materials common, commonly found in art museums, libraries, and archives. Due to their weak mouth parts, their feeding is referred to rasping um, and can be evident as, as a, like a lace-like um, irregularity, irregularity that's left on the surface. Porpoise, book lice, which is the top image, are really kind of are wingless insects that behave very silver, similar to silverfish. They like high humidity levels where they can feed on uh, microscopic mold. They might not actually damage your collection, but is often a sign of mold. So left unchecked the mold, um, left unchecked mold, it means that the mold is um, present. Termites are a lot less common, um, and but are still concern, concerning. And you should just consult a professional if you suspect termite damage. Rodents. Mice, rats are likely to sink your teeth into your collections um, and, and eat through your boxes um, until they are destroyed. So step one is preventing access to these kind of insects. So identifying, fixing the problems in the building um, and room where the structures that allow pests to enter, enter, such as like cracks in the roof or wall, doors or window seals, and then providing, uh, uh, providing for well-sealed cabinets that will deteriorate, de deter de um, access to a uh, specimen. And then just maintaining an environment in the collection areas that are not hospitable to pests. Um, pest infections are sometimes directly related to temperature and humidity. So keeping an ideal temperature and humidity will, will help decrease that. Um, and then preventing access. Keep food and food preparation far away from your collection housing, um, making sure that collection areas are kept free and clear of trash, debris, foodstuffs, and other things that would encourage pests. Good housekeeping prevents pest, uh, um, prevents infest, infection, infestations. My goodness, tongue tight now. Developing new, um, also developing new collection procedures to make sure that new collections and packing materials are safe from um, collection, from the collection area. So when you bring in a new collection, you know, it's really important to isolate it for a little while and monitor it to make sure that it doesn't have mold or um, some um, tag along guests that you don't want in your collection. Step two is monitoring. All buildings have their own eco ecosystem um, based on their location and other historical factors. Um, and some pests will always find a way inside. So just creating a monitor by, by monitoring this ecosystem and providing will provide a useful way to determine what species are common in your facility and when conditions might change to allow one species to become more common to prevent damage in, in the collection. Insect traps. Uh, this. Uh, insect traps um, are really helpful for doing this. Um, such as like sticky traps, like this one. They make a little, oh, there's three of them together here. Make a little triangle here. And then you just pull the little stick, the sheet of paper off the sticky trap. Um, and then there's also pheromone traps um, are commonly placed up throughout the collection area. Um, usually along the walls or near entry points um, to the collections area. Um, and they should be checked regularly and record what has been trapped in those um, sticky traps. Pest sightings and an uptick in pest activity um, should promote an investigation into potential causes. Here's an example of um, what you should do. 
to start your um, integrated pest management. Um, you see um, that we that these are examples from um, History of Nebraska's integrated pest management. There is, we've created a list or a map of where all the trap locations are in our building and archives. And then we use a log to monitor what um, has been found in those traps. Um, and I have an example, I'll be uploading an example of our log um, when I load up um, my handouts. So identification. Um, this is either very, very creepy or a whole lot of fun, depending on whether or not you like icky things. The University of Nebraska um, Institute for Agriculture and Natural Resources has a great website that will help you identify um, bugs that are um, com commonly found in Nebraska. But there's also a great website called Insect Identification for um, the Casual Observer which is a lot of fun, but always makes my skin crawl if I stay too long on it. Um, and then, so once you have the identification, we'll help you allow to make decisions on how to proceed um, the potentially damaging uh, activities to your collection. Identifying the pest will also aid in ensuring the proper course of um, remedial actions to be chosen. This final step four is elimination. Um, so you can use a chemical agent to deal with uh, either routine pest management or to um, take care of infestations, but that really should be left to professional pest, pest management companies who are trained and licensed in accordance with state regulations and healthy and safety standards. To deal with um, smaller infections, um, you can put the collection into um, it's easier it's common practice to put it into low temperature like freezing or low oxygen environment low oxygen environment is usually preferable for photographs rather than freezing it because if we freeze it and drop the temperature of the photograph too much if we take it out of the frozen environment, a lot of times condensation happens. And condensation is just a fancy word for water getting on your photographs. And we never want to get our water on our photographs, right? So storage conditions. Um, it's important to create that um, safe, stable environment um, with that consistent temperature and humidity level away from pests. Um, and then protect from water damage. Um, that red, red disc that's over there are these water sensors that are really great. They will start to beep if water gets near them. So if you have a common problem, um, you can pick up one of these and um, uh, it'll, it'll help you like make sure that the water isn't getting in there. Um, just pay close attention to your water resources in your in your storage area, because water can be water damage can be pretty severe. Um, flooding by nature, um, broken pipes or water heaters can be pretty devastating. Air contamination impurities can speed up determ determination deterioration. Gases given off by wood, cardboard, newspapers. And some other um, negative and some types of negatives like nitrate and acetate negatives can cause damage. Um, it also can cause fading and deterioration. Um, so solid partic particulates like dust, mold, and soot can also cause um, scratches and damage to the surface of the emulsion. So um, going back to the gases given off by wood, cardboard, and newspapers which is why um, we never store newspaper clippings with photographs, because as the paper of the newspaper breaks down, the chemical off gases that it um, gives off will actually cause your photographs to turn yellow and, imbrit and, and brittle and, and fade. So we don't want to store newspaper clippings with your photographs. Um, it's best to just photocopy your newspaper clipping and put the um, photocopy um, which is should be on archival paper um, in with it and then destroy the bad newspaper clipping. All right, so um, photograph storage. What we want from photograph storage is to provide 
support and protection. There should be three levels of protection. The enclosure, um, paper or plastic, uh, the box, and then a shelf, a good solid shelf. Um, it will help improve the organization of the collection. You can use acid-free file folders or dividers to organize the collection. And it'll also aid in um, disaster recovery as well. Um, only materials that have passed the photo activity test or PA test, PAT test should be used. Um, this means that they meet or exceed national standards and will not harm your photographs. This is not the same as archival. Archival is a word that is not regulated and um, just about anybody can slap the name archival on something um, and not go through this photo activity test. You'll see that um, the image there I took from an online catalog and right on the image itself, they are advertising that it has passed the photo activity test. So look for that when looking for photographic storage. Um, they should be acid free, lignin free, and unbuffered. Um, although new studies out of the Image Permanence um, Institute are saying that um, unbuffered and buffered um, doesn't make that much difference with most photographic materials um, as they originally thought they did. However, I found that unbuffered materials are cheaper than buffered materials. Um, choose the size closest to what you're storing. You don't want it to be too tight because you can, um, it'll be damaged when it's removed and you don't want it to be too loose because it'll be sliding around um, causing damage to the corners. Paper housing materials should be chemically safe. They should have a specific RH level. Um, buff, unbuffered is usually recommended for all types of photographs. They should be smooth and non-abrasive and they should tap pass that PAT test. No magnetic albums. We all know what I mean by a magnetic albums. Let's see if I can, I have an example of a page here somewhere. What I did anyway. Anyways, it's those, those sticky albums that you rip the, 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 the plastic sheet off the top of. Those are really, really bad, that glue will cause your photographs to turn yellow and um, stick to them. Um, so <laughs> I use this photograph um, of these paper enclosures because I wanted to point out the thumb cuts on these, on these negative enclosures. The thumb cut is just that little indentation along the edge. Um, which is supposed to aid in the removal of the photograph. My problem with the thumb cuts, and I never order things with thumb cuts um, because the thumb cut dips down and it'll expose a little tiny piece of the emulsion and a little tiny piece of the photograph. And we don't want that. The whole entire point of an enclosure is to prevent exposures and protect the image from light and pollutants and things. And that just exposes it. So my recommendation is to order things without thumb cuts. Um, but they're not that. I mean, a lot of people use them. I just don't. Because again, what's the point if you're going to have a piece of the, your emulsion exposed? OK. So plastic housing, um, the chem they need to be chemically inert and will not react with photographs. They should have no surface coatings and again, pass that PAT test. The main types are polyester, polypropylene, and polyethylene. Um, and you should avoid polyvinyl chloride, PVC. I like to use plastic enclosures for weak and damaged or brittle prints, very thin prints, and prints that are most hand, often handled or looked at images. Paper inc um, enclosures um, should always be used for nitrate and acetate negatives to allow for that off-gassing. Poorly processed prints um, in most photographic materials, they are much less expensive than plastic enclosures. 
So when you're choosing your photographic enclosures, you want to make sure that they are the close size closest to what you are sorting. If it's too big, if it's too small, it can cause damage to the photograph when it's removed. Too large, it'll cause the photographs to slide around and damage the corner. Broken glass plate negatives and items with flaking emulsions should be placed into custom sink bags. All right. Those are custom sink mat with a broken glass plate negative. And we'll talk more about that um, when we get to that section. Um, and then custom phase boxes should be made for albums and case photos. So the case photo album, similar to this, or a phase box similar to this for albums. Again, we'll talk about that more when we get to issues, the issues section. Um, and then the next thing is the thing that causes probably the most damage in my collection is just improper handling. And I'm just as guilty of improper handling um, as other people, accidents happen um, and, that ha and that's just the way it goes sometimes. So, but it's just important to try to avoid improper handling whenever possible. So even under the most ideal storage conditions, photo scraps can still be uh, harmed. Improper handling causes the most harm. Things are easily bent, torn, or cracked. And fingerprints cause damage to the emulsion and attract insects. So when I start to train my volunteers and um, staff, I go over some general artifact handling. And I just thought it was kind of a good refresher to go over this with you as well. So not only can you get an idea of how I train my volunteers, but you know, just being reminded of the, these things are always a good idea. Again, no eating or drinking is permitted, per, uh, permanent, uh, permitted in the storage area or workspaces. Excuse me. Um, hands must be clean and free of substances that could stain or damage artifacts or containers. Um, this would include food, ink, toner cartridge, hand lotion, that tacky finger stuff that some people use to turn pages and other projects. You should always wear gloves when handling photographic materials or metal objects. And do not rush. This is when accidents are most likely to happen and, um, and when damage will occur. So take your time and plan your movements. Um, you should always clear a landing surface, such as a table or work surface before moving items to the workstation. The table must be large enough, a larger than the records and no part of the record should overhang the work surface like tables, desks, or um, scanner beds. Plan out the movement and pathway of the object before actually moving anything. Make sure you have a clear work surface to set it down. Let others know that you are moving through the area with fragile materials. And always move aside for someone who is moving an item. Um, use a cart or support when moving um, things like moving one or two items. Uh, make sure that there is adequate space for the object to sit on the cart before loading it. Always maintain good body posture when moving objects. Artifacts can be very heavy. Um, and so don't endanger yourself when moving that object. Always use two hands um, or find a second or third person whenever necessary to support that item completely. Use a stepladder or a stool um, when you want to remove a object for, um, from a high shelf. You should never reach above your head to take an object off. Um, so always use a stepladder and try to maintain like a shoulder length, shoulder height distance. Never place records um, or their containers on the floor. Always place them on tables, carts, shelves, or work surfaces. And then do not place anything on top of the records. This, is inclu this includes but is not limited to other objects um, like equipment, notebooks, order forms, pencils, books, computer desks. Don't put anything on top of your photos. Um, only use pencils. Um, in near the records, um, such as boxes and folders as well. Ballpoint pens, felt tips, markers, and similar items are not permitted. Talk about more why that is uh, um, later. 
Sticky notes should never be applied to the record um, or the containers without consulting the curator. Never put the sticky substance on the sticky note um, doesn't completely remove from your photograph or from your object. So by putting it on there, you can leave behind stickiness, which will kind of attract dirt, which will attract insects, which will attract mold. So don't use um, apply uh, post-it notes directly on that. Now I use a lot of post-it notes as temporary labels on the outside of my boxes, but they are not permanent labels because obviously they're going to fall off. But they could um, potentially cause the, the box or the enclosure to um, turn acidic um, eventually. No adhesive tape should be applied to records, obviously, or their container containers. Um, containers, the, they just rip up the containers if you apply tape to it. So we just don't allow tape. So we wanted to keep our boxes looking nice because boxes are expensive. So let's keep them looking nice. Tape again will turn yellow and brittle and fall off anyway. So don't use tape as label to put on your labels. Um, do not rest, lean upon, sit upon, or otherwise exert pressure on records or their containers. Be mindful of loose clothing or dangling materials such as lanyards, jewelry, sleeves, and other ties or even ties. Um, they can dan cause damage to the surface or catch archival materials, tear them or cause them to call, fall to the ground. So like my shirt here, well, they're shorter sleeves, but if they have, you have these kind of bell shaped sleeves, you know, if you're working on the surface, you might knock something over because you were counting on that um, piece. I was working in the garden this weekend, sorry for my wounds. Um, Keep records covered or enclosed boxes or files at all time because again, light exposure is permanent and is accumulative. So just keeping them in closed boxes and folders when not in use is 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 best is the best idea. Um, except when they're being copied, photographed, or scanned. Keep records in their original orders. Return the original folder in the container con, into the containers after copying. Only remove one item at a time from the folder or container. This is not only important for your volunteers um, and staff, but it's also an important role for um, your people, your visitors or researchers. Don't let them get things out of um, order or remove more than one item at a time. Always wear gloves when using photographs. Um, you can either use not, uh, cotton gloves or uh, latex or nitrile gloves. I like my nitrile gloves. Nitrile works best for glass plate negatives. Um, damaged items are very small prints. Um, when you choose your nitrate glove or your a nitrate or our latex glove, you want to make sure that they fit properly. You don't want um, have like that, that extra end going on. You want them to fit snugly, but not tight. I'm wearing a size small. You see that they fit pretty snugly on me um, because when you're picking up things like glass plate negatives, you don't want that extra, it, that extra um, end or the gloves to be too big because you just lose that tactile feeling. Um, white cotton gloves, um, are always a good idea. However, you should know that they do provide limited protection for collections. Um, and then they also reduce that tactile sensitivity. Um, they, they're just not as, I mean, like, these are basically a second skin on me and cotton gloves are much more bulky and you don't, especially when you're dealing with very small, like gem size photographs um, or things that are glass you really need that tactile sensibility, sensitivity that cotton gloves just don't always offer. Um, it can make handling collections uh, carefully um, difficult and it can actually increase the chances of physical damage. Cotton gloves have very small hairs that can easily catch on brittle edges or, or flaking emulsions and worsen the existing tears. 
Um, and they can, are also very, very absorbent um, and thus get easily soiled and pick up dirt and dust and other materials that can transfer from the gloves to your items being handled. When handling a photograph, always use both hands. Never pick up the photograph by a corner because it could cause it to break. Avoid touching the surface of the emulsion because we don't, if it is dusty, we don't want rubbing that dust causing um, scratches to the surface. Um, support your um, image when you turn it over. So if I was gonna turn this over, a lot of times what I do is lay my hand flat on it and then turn it over. Um, it can also use like um, a spatula to help, help turn it over. You slip the spatula underneath it and then turn it over for added support. If the photograph must be moved a short distance um, or turned over for examination, you can use an auxiliary support, such as something like a piece of, um, cardboard or a piece of folder stock, just kind of slip it underneath it and then transport it, transport your item by carrying the support rather than actually touching the negative. You can also usually easily turn it over as well using that support. Um, it'll help prevent um, bending and flexing. Um, work in an uncluttered surface, uh, clean surface. Um, always use a cart to transporting photographs, especially glass plate negatives. Never hand carry photographs or boxes containing photographs from your stack to your workplace. Try to use a cart whenever possible. If it's just one or two things like in a folder or one small box, um, that's usually okay. Um, but I always recommend, always, it, especially be careful on stairs. We have an elevator. I take the elevator whenever I'm transferring, uh, uh, transporting collections, even if it's just one photo. Like damages, cumulative and permanent. I can't say that enough. Um, so limit the amount of time the photo is exposed to light. Stereographs, which I forgot to pull out, are often curled. Um, as well as like, I don't know if you've seen like those turtle back photographs that are often in the, the curved glass uh, frames. Those are curled. They, so don't attempt to flatten them or press down on the curve. Even when scanning, don't press down on that curve because you can snap them in half. Um, and the same goes with the turtle back or curved photographs. Um, give patrons viewing collections a brief tutorial on um, proper handling. Um, you might even want to consider creating a like little sign or handout when they come in to look at photos. Okay, so this might seem obvious, but um, this is how you should remove um, negatives from enclosures. To remove a photograph from in an enclosure, you should squeeze along the long edges and that'll pop it open. And then wearing gloves, gently grab the photograph at the center of the edge, not by a corner, and then slowly slide the photo or negative out. If the photo catches along the edge, you should gently shimmy it back and forth to release it. Return the negatives to the enclosure with the emulsion side facing up and away from the seams. Or if you can see, this is a seam back here on the back of a, a paper enclosure. You want that away from the emulsion because that can actually cause um, pressure or cause uh, scratches or, or pressure along the edge. So make sure that the emulsion side is up rather than the dull side. Okay. Rolls of film should be, cur should be rewound with the emulsion side inside, not um, whenever, whenever possible. All right. Labeling photographs, use a pencil, always use a pencil. Good old number two works great for a lot of photographs, but a trick that I learned from a photo conservator a long time ago is to use these art pencils that are 100% graphite, a woodless graphite pen. Um, uh, I prefer 6B, which um, you can, maybe you can see better on this one. 
it's usually stamped like right on the side what weight it is pick these up um at any art supply store hobby lobby joann's michael's um i think i've even seen them in the craft section at walmart um, you can easily order them online um, and they will write on even modern coded photographs on the back of them here's my puppy dog just to give you prove that you can puppy dog modern coded photographs so shows up really really nicely it also can be easily removed as well, which is always our golden rule, never do anything that you can't easily undo to any photograph or artifact. Always write along the back edge. Um, never write on the front, like this poor photograph example to um, on my screen. Um, and then do not write over information that is written on the back of the photograph. Try to find a blank spot. Um, if it, and if there is no blank spots on the back of the photograph, consider putting them into a paper enclosure and then writing the information on the paper enclosure. Of course, writing it on the paper enclosure before you put the artifact in. You don't want to write your information while the photograph is in the, um, in the enclosure. Pens and markers um, can easily bleed through paper and smear. And then why we want to, well, the main reason we want to avoid pens, even on labels and on the outside of envelopes is because in a disaster um, or flooding, that, that ink will run and it will transfer onto your artifact, making it much more difficult to clean and restore the photograph that is already damaged because now you have to not only deal with mold and water damage you have to deal with ink damage so by using by not using pens and by using only pencils it'll save you a lot of headaches and um, should you ever have a disaster um oh you can always write additional information on the on the enclosure or a photocopy rather than the original photograph we want to try to avoid as writing on the back of the photograph as much as possible um, because you know when you press too hard you can cause the photograph to like to emboss and and, and show through so you want to avoid writing as much as possible um, for like group shots like if you have a group of people like these men here what i like to do is just go photocopy this and then I can just circle their faces on the photocopy and write their names in the margin of the, the paper, um, rather than trying to back row seated um, left to right. I would never write all that information on the back of the photograph myself. It's, a, it's already back there, awesome, because we love identified photographs. Do not attempt to repair photographs yourself. Even the best intentions can cause more damage Tears are often best left unmended. Again, tears are often best left unmended. Do not use tape, glue, rubber cement, staples, thumbtacks, or anything else to repair your photographs. Um, tape, glue, rubber cement, staples, thumbtacks will just cause further damage. Staples rust, thumbtacks rust, rubber cement, glue, tape all turn yellow and cause embrittlement and fading. Um, so put your torn photograph into a plastic sleeve. Never use rubber bands or paper or metal paper clips to bind photographs together. I can't tell you how many um, stacks of photographs I come in with rubber bands, old crunchy rubber bands stuck to them, and they're very hard and annoying to get off. And they usually caught, leave behind an indention and um, deterioration, yellowing. Um, sticky substances behind. Um, you can use these plastic paper clips, but I temporarily, I don't recommend using them for permanent storage because again, the pressure caused by the paper clips can cause, um, you know, like an indentation into the paper. Uh, or into the photograph, and we don't want that. We want to keep the photographs as pristine as possible. 
So a little bit about preservation versus conservation. Um, usually our goal is to preserve, to prolong the existence of the collections. So we're usually, curators are usually dealing with preservation rather than conservation. And preservation is caring for your photographs by monitoring the environment, controls, proper storage, safe handling, and um, leading display, uh, uh, display practices. Conservation, on the other hand, are, is a profession devoted to pres um, preserving cultural property. It includes examining, treating, and documenting artifacts. And if you do want to contact, a cons um, oops, do not attempt to um, a, attempt to clean or repair your heirloom photographs yourself, or allow anyone, even commercial photographers, not trained in photographic conservation, to restore your photographs. Always consult a professional conservator. And by restore your photographs, I don't mean digitally, I mean like physically. Digitally is, is a whole different thing. They're not touching or harming the original photograph, which is what we're talking about today. You can use a soft um, brush to remove, gently remove dust particles. Um, the one at the left is a photograph brush. I like these. I've got a couple, I've got a bunches of these um, for my volunteers and stuff to use. It's a natural hair brush, um, which is very, very soft. It's great for gently removing dust particles from the surface of the photograph. But you can also use natural um, haired makeup brushes as well. This brush usually does run about $15, um, but um, it can, you can easily clean it with a little gentle um, soap. Um, and then it'll, and then letting it dry. So if you have any questions uh, or you wanted to consult a um, conservator, the Ford Center is in Omaha and is always available to answer questions or to consult on treatments um, for the items in your collection that um, you want to uh, have conserved. All right. Questions before we move on to identifying issues and what to do about them. Oh, thank you, Vonda, for sharing the museumpest.net site. That's another helpful one. Yeah, so far, I don't see any questions coming in, Karen. Okay. Oh, here is one that just popped in um, from Brock Anderson. What policies have you changed in handling objects during COVID? So during COVID, um, we have been isolating our collections um, for the three days, which um, there's been um, extensive testing by IMLS, um, Institute for Museum and Library Sciences, to um, uh, that, that the COVID virus will live on the surface of most materials for um, no more than three days or for less than three days. So usually when we bring something in, we're very careful to wear our masks and wear our gloves. Um, and then we usually isolate them for three days before we are handling them, before we handle them. Um, I'm lucky because I have a lab with, um, that I can isolate items in easily. Um, that for not only for COVID, but for also pests and um, mold. Um, uh, storing curled photographs. So it depends on how curled the photograph is. If it's a roll print, a rolled panoramic print, we'll talk about that in a little bit. If it's something that is just slightly um, curled, um, what I like to do is place it between two pieces of cardboard like that, and then use weights. Um, and this would be like um, curled, curled um, unmounted photographs. Um, so not like, not like something like this, because you don't want to be able to do that, but like if it was a paper photograph. And then put it in a weight and then leave it for a few days and monitors monitor that. Um, if it is a tightly rolled, if it is a tightly rolled 
um, panoramic like this. We'll, we'll talk more about humidity cha chambers, um, humidity, uh, creating a humidity chamber um, later on in the program. All right, so Brock, when you isolate these documents and artifacts, <laughs> what, would, what would you do uh, for the tables and carts and other materials in the process? Oh, yeah, I wipe them down with an alcohol solution after, um, after we remove them. Um, usually I just have a little spray bottle. I even use, I keep this little spray bottle even on my desk to continue to wipe down my, um, in between handling collections as well. Um, just to keep my, the surface, uh, my surface nice and clean, either my work surface or, um, uh, just wherever I am just to kind of um, clean up the surface off between it. Okay. And this is basically like 50, like just some um, isopropyl alcohol with some de deionized water. All right, any other questions? Where am I at for time? Oh my. Okay. On to identifying issues and what to do with them. I was gonna say, I was gonna call this problems, but I thought maybe that was a negative connotation, but they really are problems. So um, let's identify some issues. First ones, albums and scrapbooks. There you go. These often re um, represent a unique challenge um, and because they often have mixed media inside of them. So, the first big question is whether to take them apart or leave them as is. And that kind of depends on the condition of the, eval of the album. So evaluate the condition of the photograph and the pages of the album. I tend to try to keep them together as much as possible because I like to think of them as visual diaries. Whoever created this album put these photographs together in a specific order to tell a story. I hope anyway, um, for the most part. So I like to keep them together whenever possible. But that said, sometimes these things deteriorate very rapidly, uh, pages deteriorate rapidly. If the photographs appear in good condition, leave them together. You can interleaf the pages with acid-free tissue paper. The tissue paper will absorb the acids in the album pages, but you should monitor them regularly, just like with quilts. You might have to replace those tissue paper um, interleavings um, on a regular basis if it's a super acidic um, album page, or if the non-photographic materials in the uh, tissue uh, in the um, uh, album or scrapbook is um, acidic. Um, a great example of this is we have a we have a scrapbook that has a starfish in it, a dried up starfish, which is a challenge to preserve. Um, cabinet card albums. Get my cabinet card album here. I of course chose the messiest one because of course velvet just starts to deteriorate and like flake off on your hands as soon as possible. I try to attempt to do this. But a lot of times they have these gilded borders around the photograph. And that gilded border will actually cause is actually like a copper sub copper something. And that can actually get onto your photograph and to cause these light spots to appear or gold spots to appear on your photograph. Um, so those I often recommend interleaving, like putting a piece of mylar or tissue between the photograph and the border. Um, mylar just is the brand name of um, that plastic film that we use for encapsulations or enclosures. 
So when you're handling a scrapbook or um, album or any other bound materials, do not press down on the binding. Do not try to flatten out the pages. Some albums are held together with strings. Those strings can be removed for like scanning or photocopying. Um, and then care and then they can be carefully restrung for storage. Um, and then just be just be very careful when um, you're finished with it. So the Iowa Conservation and Preservation Consortium has a great website. They recommend storing um, in archival boxes. You can either buy pre-made ones or make custom size. Custom size phase boxes. This is the box for that velvet album. Um, Um, and they should either be stored flat or spine down, depending on the type of album. So flat or um, stored down. Um, when I store, when I put these um, on the shelf, I of course label the end of it with the um, collection name, um, what it is. And then you can see this arrow right here. And that tells me how it should be placed back on the shelf. So it should be laying flat on the shelf because the spine is broken on this one. And then here is the location within the collection uh, that it needs to go back to. Um, let's see. Depending on the stock, uh, so shelving small or medium sized scrapbooks on uh, like books between similar objects will help prevent warping. So some, some of my more stable albums are stored kind of vertically, but we store them like books um, so that they don't slump or fall over. Um, so they nice have uh, the stored upright vertical. Loose or detached covers can be tied up like a package with co flat cotton tape, um, but always place the bow. Always place the bow on the sides. Um, usually I like to place it on the side with the pages exposed. You never wanna push the bow or the knot on the top of the album because that bow or knot can cause a da da damage um, when other items are stored you know, next to it vertically or stuff because that it'll cause pressure and it could cause an indent into the photo album. So try to put your bow over along the side. When I make my phase boxes, I don't tend to use strings. What I do is use, I cut a little slat into this, and then this just kind of folds in. So if you do need to take apart a photo album for whatever reason, usually it's because the um, paper itself um, has started to deteriorate. I always like to cause, call those photo albums well-loved. Um, so take them apart as a last resort. However, magnetic photo pages should always, always be removed. The Smithsonian has a great video out there um, that shows you how to use dental floss using kind of a sign method behind the photograph to remove it, um, as well as gives tips on using um, a blow dryer to cause a little heat too. Um, so you can Google that or I'll provide a link for it um, after the uh, conference. Um, consider photocopying or scanning the album first um, as part of documenting it. This will help preserve the story of the album and then document everything. Document the condition, why you're taking it apart, which photos um, went on which pages, etc. Uh, scrapbooks often have raised surfaces or three-dimensional decorations and moving parts like a starfish. Um, they, and they can um, present unique, fragile, and damaged, and they should really be handled with a lot of care. Um, use book cradles um, to support the volumes. Uh, you can buy fancy book cradles. Um, you can make them out of wedges of wood, which I like to, if I have wood ones, I like to wrap them in tin foil and then um, put a, like a, 
at the foam on the surfaces. The tin foil will just help will help with the off gassing of the wood, although they're not really touching the surface of the wood for very long. So um, I, you don't have to do the tin foil. Um, you can use a book snake like this. It's um, just it's this one happens to be chains inside of this, and this will help hold the pages down when examining it or scanning it or, photogra or photographing it as well. Um, it's actually pretty easy to make these as well. You can um, use, um, I've seen them you made with like marbles or lead pellets, things like that, just as long as the outside is kind of a soft muslin um, is good. Um, and unbleached, of course. Turn pages carefully um, by the edges. Fragile or heavy pages should be supported with your hand when turning the pages. Page turners can also be useful, um, like a micro spatula. These micro spatulas are really, really handy for a lot of things. Um, and then you can slip uh, like a piece of paper in between to help support to help turn the pages. Custom phase boxes. Um, albums, scrapbooks, and other bound materials should um, be stored in these. This is actually my um, photograph album storage right there. That is from my archives. Uh, I had a wonderful work study make almost all of those boxes. It was like a two year process. Um, protection, uh, they offer protection from wear and tear, um, access, uh, and then they also are less expensive than pre-made boxes. Um, what most of my albums were in pre-made boxes that were too big for the albums. And by putting them into custom size boxes, um, I was able to reduce the storage space that those albums were taken up by almost 30%. Um, custom phase boxes can be made in about five minutes and they help um, protection from fire damage and um, other temperature and humidity fluctuations, all that kind of fun stuff. Things you need for making a phase box um, is a T-square, utility knife, a bone folder, a steel ruler, cutting mats, a cutting mat for a working surface, um, and a pencil, and then acid-free board. You can either use corrugated board like this. Um, but I tend to make mine out of um, kind of the thicker folder stock like this. It's a little cheaper. Um, I was going to play this, but I'm kind of running a little low on time. The Upsilla University Archives has a great tutorial of how to make a five minute phase box. Um, and I will share that link after the um, uh, after the conference on my resources page. So rolled photographs. The four step process to flatten a piece of rolled store a uh, rolled photograph. Um, you don't want to never try to flatten um, things with oil paints, watercolors, charcoals, chalks, or pastels. Um, the National Park Service Conserva Ground 13.2, which I will also link to, um, will will um, lay has really great instructions, very detailed instructions on how to do it. You want to start with pink, uh, clean paper. Um, and then assemble the humidity chamber, which is usually um, a, I, I just use like um, tubs, like storage tubs, like plastic storage tubs. I have a big one and then a slightly smaller one um, inside of it. Um, you can take the piece of humid, uh, and then you humidify the paper. You, what you do is um, fill the bottom of the bigger tub with uh, like maybe an inch or two of water and then put the bigger tub, the smaller tub on the, to the water, probably an inch or less of water, I should say. Um, and then use um, some uh, 
paper and things to uh, protect the photograph. I like to put a piece of paper or a piece of plastic over the photograph or the rolled um, panoramic. Um, and then you seal up the humidity chamber for, um, I always like to check mine every six uh, to eight hours. Um, and you shouldn't go any more than like 24, 36 hours um, for it to flatten. And then you very soft, gently unroll the photograph. Um, be careful not to put anything directly on the emulsion. And then you can place weights around the edges. Um, and then I usually like to use um, like a rag board uh, to help protect the photograph as well underneath the actual photo. Oversized prints. Um, generally, I consider anything that is over 11 by 14 oversized. These should always be stored flat um, in drop box, in drop front boxes. Does Okay. Generally, there are, there's lots of different types of boxes. But when I refer to a clamshell box, this is what I mean by a clamshell box. It opens kind of like a clam. If you lay it flat, you can easily um, take things out of it on this end. And then a drop box, a drop front box, is usually kind of these telescoping boxes that will have one end that folds down. So again, you can easily remove the photos this way rather than trying to grab at the edges to pull them out. You can either use a drop front box, an oversized drop front box, that's obviously not an oversized one, or store them in uh, mat cases or, or drawers, um, flat storage drawers. Um, and then put them into oversized folders as well. You can encapsulate for addition, additional support, but never, never laminate. Lamination is permanent and encapsulation is not permanent. Encapsulation is taking two pieces of mylar and using this tape, the 3D 415 tape um, to go along the edges of that. Um, again, there's lots of handouts out there about how to encapsulate things, um, which I won't bore you with. Um, slides and transparencies. There's several ways to store slides and um, transparencies, like 35 millimeter slides, lantern slides, and other things. Um, 35 millimeter slides can either be stored in um, a couple different types of, um, you can either use these rigid ones or these plastic ones um, for storage. If it's a big, a big slide con collection, I like to use these little tiny boxes within a box. Um, it just, this saves a lot more space than having to have the slide pages and binders and things. This is much more compact storage um, and is saves a lot more space when you have a large collection of, um, of slides. Um, for lantern slides, I recommend um, purchasing four flap negative enclosures. They build up, they um, have them pre-made specifically for lantern slides. Um, and then monitor your collar slides for deterioration. And um, if they do start to see uh, decoloration and uh, fading, you should put them into cold storage. I just realized I forgot to say when I was talking about storage, do not store your um, negative or your slides in those slide carousels. They should always be removed from the slide carousels. Not only are they um, really, they, they take up way too much space. They're just not archival. Um, the boxes that they come in aren't archival. The, the slide carousels can off gasp, it's bad plastic. I just don't recommend storing them in the carousel. Okay, so cold storage for nitrate and acetate film, long-term preservation of film-based negatives. Um, it's essential for long-term storage of film-based negatives. It'll help provide a stable environment. 
Um, it extends longevity and preserves them for future use. Um, research proves that cold storage can add hundreds of years to film-based materials. Um, and you can, and maybe implement it with um, freezers or vaults. What should be, you, what should, what benefits from cold storage? Well, negatives, like I've said, either rolled or sheet or rolled film, acetate, uh, nitrate, acetate, or colored. But again, don't store glass plate negatives in there because we worry about the condensation. Um, we're storing things in, um, in cold storage because of the substrate that they're on, not the uh, emulsion. So glass is very stable and, and don't, doesn't deteriorate nitrate or acetate substrates do. Um, slides or other transparencies, motion picture films, microfilm, microfilm or microfiche, if you have masters rather than copies, um, x-ray film and aerial film. Cold storage can be limited, so you really need to prioritize your film collect, uh, what is going to go into corn cold storage. Um, I always recommend starting with nitrate film um, and then moving on to acetate films that are showing signs of deterioration um, or are starting that vinegar syndrome um, and starting to smell like rotten pickles. And then finally, color negatives and slides. Usually that's because these are on polyester. And as long as they aren't exposed to color or to light, um, they're fairly stable. Um, but cold, they will definitely benefit from cold storage. The National Park Service has a great website all about cold storage, which the link will be on the resources page after the conference. Broken or flaking glass plate shade negatives should be stored in um, these custom sink mats. They should be stored horizontally with all the fragments in the same housing. Um, and they should be kept out of contact with each other. You can see with this one, we had these little pieces of foam in between the broken pieces to keep the, the sharp edges from rubbing on each other, um, causing the emulsion to flip. Uh, or to flake off. So creating a sink mac, um, you construct it with neutral pH, um, neutral color board. I like the blue board. Um, it and then um, consists of four base and four, uh, and then you have uh, you create a four a frame on the outside using four strips of um, of the same corrugated board. You need gloves, double uh, coated. I think that's supposed to be tape and not tame. So I apologize for the typo. Um, a, a neutral pH corrugated board. Um, Vlora form is what I use, which is this really awesome soft foam. Um, and the book binding tape um, to kind of seal along the edges. That's what a sink mat looks like um, in construction. And again, these instructions will be on the website. Uh, cleaning glass plate negatives. Um, you use it to, uh, you'll need a soft hair brush um, and then uh, cleaning tissues or cotton. I, I like cotton balls, ethanol, deionized water, um, a non spill container, cotton swabs, paper towels, um, a nice cleaning surface, nitrate gloves. Um, the surface. Of the object should be clean, uh, should be clean and cleared of a non-abrasive color. I like to work when I'm work cleaning on glass plate negatives. I use a sheet of this Valorex form because it keeps the, the negative from sliding around and it kind of gives it a nice soft surface to set on. Make sure you have an adequate ventilation system to help reduce the fumes. Um, and then the cleaning person cleaning the negatives um, should wear long sleeves or nitrile gloves to help prevent the absorption of the ethanol. Um, into the skin. When you clean the emulsion side of the negative, just use this gentle brush to very softly sweep along the emulsion side. Um, if it is flaking, do not try to clean it. Um, just leave it as is and put it into a sink mat. Uh, if you have any um, questions, consult the photographs, a uh, photograph curator or paper conservator. Um, I think I'm gonna 
you can clean the glass, the glass side of the negative, um, the non emulsion side of the negative using um, a solution of 50% water or deionized water and 50% um, alcohol. Um, and then using uh, either cotton balls or q tips to very easily remove that dirt and dust on there. Do you do want to make sure you let the negatives completely dr um, dry before putting it back or putting it into a new enclosure? Don't put it back into the dirt. It's dirty enclosure, obviously, because then the, the dirt left over in the envelope will just get back onto your clean negative. Okay. Um, do we have any really quick questions? I know um, before we move on to the last two topics of research and identification and creating access to digitization. No? No, I don't see any coming in, Karen. Okay. Okay, so um, a lot of times people ask me, well, can you identify this unidentified person in my photograph? And my answer is usually no. Um, no, just plain no. Uh, it's really hard to identify photographs um, that are completely unidentified. But if you do have something with like incomplete information or partial information, um, we all have those photographs that are identified just as grandma or uncle Duke or something common like that, that are either unaddated or unidentified. What you can do is look for all these clues to come up with, um, a, a, to come up with maybe a partial identification. So you look at the type of photograph it is. Um, we know that like, Album imprints are most common from the 1860s to about 1885. So that might help you identify which generation that photograph is. What's actually in the photograph and then looking at the family history. Here's a great little slide that kind of gives you an idea when things were most common, daguerreotypes, amber types, album imprints, all of those kind of fun things. And I taught you how to identify each one of those. So now you can use that knowledge to help identify your photographic process and the dates when they were most common. So if you look at the style of the photograph, you can see a lot of the times what and date that um, the more you look at it. So I know that this type of photograph with the man on it um, is most likely from the 1880s by the type of the background that they look at you're looking at. Um, those painted backgrounds with that are like look like parlors or have some sort of exterior view. Um, pillars or um, chairs are very common during this period uh, in the 1880s. Um, and then also um, just the style of the card itself, um, I know is more common from that time period. I also know that it's an Ambro or an Albumin print, so that would date it pre-1890s. Um, and then you can look at the style of the clothing as well. This one uh, with the two young women, the style of the card is much different. Um, you'll see as we move towards the turn of um, the 19th century, turn like 1900 or so, they may have dropped the, it was less fashionable to have your um, business identification on the bottom of the card. Um, so I know that that was something that happened in the late 1890s and then the, um, after um, the turn of the century. Real photographic postcards. Um, Kodak um, first put out the, full, the first postcard film camera in about 1903. It's really allowed the general public to be able to become photographers themselves. Um, and they could actually send them away to have them printed onto postcard backs. Um, they were easy to share and send back and forth. They were, oops, sorry, um, most common, I can always date a postcard um, with a divided back, which means just the line down the back. The line down the back was required after 1909. So um, you can always date a postcard to about that time period or later. 
So uh, again, Naren Dine, when the picture was taken by possibilities, who the photographer was, where they lived in business. Um, if you're a local historical society, you know the value of having, um, knowing which photographer was in business when and where uh, will help you date your photographs. Again, photographer props, um, the more you kind of get an idea of that, fashion and hairstyles are always helpful. There's lots of books out there uh, about fashion and hairstyles available for photographs. I really like this one. It's called Dress for the Photographer. It's, of course, I pick up one, the one page without a photograph, but it really breaks down each century um, from about the 18, I think 50s through about 1900. And it breaks it down um, about the clothing styles, photo styles, and things like that. That is a really handy resource guide when trying to date photographs. There's also a great website too called the Costumers Manif Manifesto, um, which has a lot of links and resources as well. And then just try to fit the photograph within whatever family history that you're um, researching. You can compare photographs. These are all photos of Willa Cather at different stages of her life. So you can look for distinguishing features. Um, a lot of times your ear shapes don't change over time. Um, so those are things that you want to look at. Uh, ear shapes, chin shapes, nose. Noses actually do change over time. Hairline, things like that. And then just document your guesses. If you think it is, you can always say um, possibly John Smith circa 1910. Um, and then you might even want to explain your reasoning. Okay. Creating access through digital imaging, which I know I am running really late. So we'll talk about this quickly. Um, you can either make analog copies or digital copies. Digital copies are made through either scanning and digitization. Um, you should know that one, it can be done either um, with a camera or by a scanner. There's sometimes quality control issues, like you wanna make sure you have this right resolution, size and format, as well as um, good quality equipment. And then it is a digital commitment. Um, there's two types of digital images we usually refer to, either digital secure uh, surrogates, which are digital copies made from the original print or negative, and um, that are usually either made by a scanner or a digital camera. And then there's the born digital things. These are things that are made with a digital camera, like your cell phone, all those photos on your cell phone uh, roll are born digital photographs. And there would be no um, prior analog copy or print or negative be um, before that. It was always digital. So when you go to digital, you should know that it is um, a commitment issue that you'll always be chasing the te um, technology. You know, everything is obsolete as soon as you take it out of the box. But, and by going digital, you're committing yourself to keeping up with that technology. And it will always be an ongoing process and probably should become a line in your budget. Um, because we already know that we've moved from floppy disks to cloud storage. Um, back in the day, they used to say gold store, gold CDs were the thing to store things on, that they would last 75 to 100 years. But now we know that that's not true. Those gold CDs are just as vulnerable to CD rot um, and just as unstable as every other CD. So all that extra money we poured into gold CDs back in the day have come to, uh, uh, come to pass. Um, so about resolution, spatial resolution or PPI. Um, PPI is the pixels per inch which um, most accurately describes a digital image. It refers to an online, on-screen display. DPI, dots per, event, per inch, is a description of output print. It's what printers use. Now, a lot of times we just use these interchangeably as shorthand, and that's not that big of a deal. But I do want you to understand that PPI, and there is a difference between PPI and DPI. PPI refers to how many pixels is on your screen and DPI refers to how many dots your printer makes per inch. Um, 
high resolution has many pixels per inch. Higher resolution shows very high detail. Low resolution has low pixels per inch and show low levels of detail. Here's a great example. This is a uh, race at the uh, Nebraska State Fairgrounds. Um, inside the little red box is a woman. And you can see the difference between a 150 DPI versus 100, um, 1200 DPI um, when I scan from this negative. There is, however, a thing called digital threshold. So higher isn't always better, especially when you're dealing with things like maps and documents um, um, and then tonal variations on photographs. What happens if you, use, you scan at a too higher resolution, you'll actually be scanning the paper fibers rather than the image. And um, that can cause um, uh, fuzziness to the image or create noise. That's what we like to call it is like it creates noise in your image if you scan too high. Um, and just remember that you should always have a plan whenever you enter into digital imaging. Um, decide what you want to scan, um, everything or just the most vulnerable. Um, setting priorities is a must. Um, again, negatives, nitrate negatives and acetate negatives are the most vulnerable things in your collection. So, or you can start with, um, with things that have high use. So you have to decide um, things that are with high use are getting lots of handling. So digitization and sharing those digital images will reduce the handling and possible potential damage to those photographs. Um, but you should also consider um, condition as well. So, and then decide why you're for, um, preserving, why you're digi digitizing. Are you wanted to, to preserve, um, preserve the original, um, to slow down that deterioration and prevent overhandling, or are you just digitizing to share with others? The why determines the priorities, equipment, and standards. Equipment, it's hard for me to give advice on equipment because the scanner I recommend today will be obsolete tomorrow. So you really need to just do your research, check reviews, um, and talk to friends, fellow techies, um, other um, colleagues, all that kind of stuff. And then decide what you want and your budget and then find the scanner that best fits your needs. Um, we do a lot, we scan a lot of negatives. So all of our scanners have a tr um, transparency media adapter, um, which is a special lid that has a light source in the lid that will help reflect through the negative and get a really nice image from it. Um, you want to create master files. These master files should, you should have a standard for them. The resolution should be very high, as high as possible between 600 and 1200 PPI or DPI. Um, um, and it should always be either an uncompressed TIFF or a, a JPEG 2000 um, or PDF for paper objects. These are, are they have no information lost. Um, and then do not alter or edit your masters. So no Photoshopping of your masters. Um, and then these are the images that you wanna back up and store separately. Derivatives or access files um, are created from your master files and they can be a lower resolution or a different size based on your project needs. So if you're making um, either putting it in your newsletter versus putting it on an exhibit, you might want different sizes or resolutions for that. Um, usually these are lower resolution. Print, uh, most printers print at 300 DPI um, and screen is usually about 150 to 200 PPI. And these can be um, compressed files like JPEGs. Um, Every time you open and close a JPEG, it recompresses the file and you lose little bits of data every time you open and close a JPEG. A TIFF does not do that. It is uncompressed, so it always stays stable, whereas the JPEG compresses, opens, compresses, and each time it's compressed, it loses a little more information. Your derivatives or access copies of what you can edit, you can adjust the color, you can remove the scratches and the dust and the tears from your access copy, but never your master copy. I also want to say about the master copy is this is also a great way to um, monitor your deterioration as well, because that scan is a moment in time. So you'll know what it looks like at the moment you scan it. You should always, of course, keep that metadata um, of when and how it was scanned. 
Um, storage of master files are very large. Um, and the more information there, and there's just more information to access. So choose the media that best fits your need and plan on refreshing and upgrading that media whenever possible. Plan for failures and disasters and think about your worst case scenario. Um, and then try to outthink your worst case scenario. Multiple media, try multiple media approaches like redundant or twin hard drives for backup. Um, media output like CDs, DVDs, Blu-rays, flash drives. Um, and then also cloud storage is probably what I would recommend most likely this year, which can be expensive, but is worth it in the end, I think. Um, you should probably have at least three copies of your master files somewhere. Um, and then make copies and put it somewhere safe. You, and also like offsite or cloud storage is great. Share it with friend or safety deposit boxes. You know, this is where the Nebraska Museums Association, you can work with a neighboring um, historical society and trade each other's copies. And then refresh your backups regularly to make sure that nothing has started to deteriorate, um, do checksums, that kind of things. In conclusion, finally, Remember these simple rules, temperature and humidity levels um, are important, avoid exposure, use display copies whenever possible, watch for things that are eating or pooping on your um, um, photographs, create a stable environment, use storage materials that have passed the PIT test, be mindful of how you handle your photographs, always use gloves and pencils, and do not attempt to repair items yourself. Um, I'm going to have a large list of handouts um, as well as resources um, available after the conference um, sometime this week um, so that you can uh, look back on all this, as well as a copy of my slideshow as well. Okay, questions. I think we have maybe got like a minute. <laughs> Yeah, so um, Tammy has a couple of questions. So I'll say all of them and you can address them together or separately. So is there a good way to scan to make digital several four inch by five inch glass negatives from the 1910 era? And can this be done with cost in mind, like using a negative light box? And then she also asks, do you store the glass negative upright or flat? Um, so yeah, you can use a negative light box as well and then photograph it um, using the light box. But honestly, if you can put it on a scanner, that's the best way to do it. There are ways to, if you don't have a transparency media adapter, you can create this like weird little um, box that will reflect the light back um, to do it um, as well. Um, I, I haven't made one of those yet because I've always had a transparency media adapter. Um, and you should always store your glass plate negatives vertical. Always store your glass plate negatives vertical, well, never horizontal because the pressure from the ones on top will cause the bottom ones to crack or break. So always store them vertical in a box. I don't, and don't put glass plate negatives in like drawers because every time you open and cause open and close the drawer, the concussion could cause the negative to break. All right, and my email is on on there. So if you do have any questions afterwards, do feel free to email me at any time. Well, thank you, Karen. You've gotten um, several compliments in the chat box thank for you. your session. So you did a great job. It's a lot of information. And thank you for making all of those resources available after the conference, too, for people. So, um, so this concludes Karen's photograph workshop. So we'd like to welcome everybody back to the conference at one o'clock for Dr. Nathan Tai's presentation, the Introduction to Web-Based Digital History Tools. Um, feel free to you know, log out and we can um, log you or get you back in through the waiting room. Or if you just want to sit tight on, on this and stay logged in, that is fine. But we will be back with everyone at one o'clock. Well, that's one o'clock central, but 12 p.m. mountain time. So thanks. <laughs>